All right, welcome everyone to our happy hour session. My name is Marissa True. I am the host of Tez Talks Radio, the global Tezos ecosystem podcast, as well as the head of content for TZ APAC. Uh, so this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce none other than Cleo Thomas, an actor and content creator. So welcome, Cleo. Thank you, thank you for having me. So how are you today? Amazing. Uh, this is my, I believe, fourth time coming to South by Southwest. Uh, a couple years ago, when I was doing music, I was here three years in a row performing at all the crazy stages. Uh, so to be in the, you know, a new chapter of my life, uh, being in the content creation side, the producer side, it's really great to come here and be able to talk tech now especially. So it's really cool how the journey goes. So things coming full circle. But before we get into that, let's actually dig a little more into your history. Cool. What, what were your beginnings? What brought you to th where you are now? Oh, uh, beginnings. I told my mom I wanted to be an actor at five. And we okay. were, we were, at that time, we were living in Germany because my dad was in the military. And uh, my mom was like, hmm, like, that's a very random thing to say at five years old. Uh, you know, my dad gets out of the military. We make it back into L.A. Uh, my mom asked me, is this something that I still would like to do? And I told her, yes. Uh, we began auditioning for things. And uh, the first role, the first breakout role that I had was a film called Holes when I played the character Zero. Uh, from there, I went on to do films like Walking Tall with The Rock and uh, Roll Bounce with uh, Bow Wow and Shy McBride. And most recently of, of the films went on to do uh, Shameless, which is, uh, of course, on Showtime, Major Crimes. And uh, yeah, it's been a great journey as far as the acting side goes. Uh, but I've always been a gamer as well. Gaming is a huge part of my, like, my coping as far as like dealing with all the craziness of a set. So like every set I've ever been on, I've always had a video game to play right there like in my trailer so it's been cool to be able to build out my twitch channel over the last uh two years with the pandemic like really letting me focus in on that and uh for music it was great because right after roll bounce uh you know this is during the era where bow wow was the biggest young rap artist at the time he was the only one selling out arenas so for you know we do roll bounce he takes me under his wing and i, I got to see madison square garden sold out two nights in a row just being by this kid's side, which is still like a crazy thing to think about, but it's an amazing experience and journey that I'm very honored to have, yeah. So we're looking at film, then we're looking at music, we're yep. also looking at gaming. Yeah. Now we're venturing more into deep tech. Yeah. Because obviously we're here for one thing and one thing alone, and that is blockchain technology. Blockchain technology. So let's actually uncover how you ventured into that space. How did you fall down this rabbit hole? <laughs> Tech has always been something that I've always had my eye on and ear on, really, because of my brother. My brother, Kadeem, who's here, he's a huge tech guy. He is my literal, like, with all my friends call him the tech genius and the tech guy because there's nothing that he hasn't, you know, kept an eye on or seen what's the latest update of things. And, um, you know, when NFT started being more talked about in our social circles, my brother was, he hit me the game. He's like, yo, this is what's going on. And as soon as he gave me a breakdown of everything that was happening, it became a lot more interesting to me as a content creator uh, in this space that we're in now, especially with social media and all these different platforms. It's like, yo, being able to hone your creativity, but also being able to own your creativity mm -hmm. is something that really you know, spoke to me. So one question was act I actually was going to ask was, who was the person, as you were peeking into that rabbit hole, shoved you into it? So it's great to know my that brother. your, bro your my brother's brother here in the room. And it's crazy because he's my <laughs> little brother. Like I'm, like, I'm the oldest, and then he's three years younger than me. We have a little brother who's nine years younger than, than, than me, and then I have a baby sister who just turned 18 who just got a driver's license. So it's like, <laughs> it's insane. It's crazy. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was my brother for sure, yeah. So what was the actual first lesson that you learned? What was the thing that piqued your interest? Was it NFTs? It and was the it, NFTs. It was What yeah. NFT specifically were you looking at? So I had done this campaign for Ghostbusters, the most recent one that came out, mm -hmm. and uh, they had gifted me an NFT. And I was like, okay, cool. I've heard about this, heard about these being a thing, and that's how I described it. Like mm -hmm. I heard about these being a thing, and my brother was like, hold on. <laughs> Let me see that for a second. Hold my drink. <laughs> he was like, let me, see, let me see this for a second. So then he just, he started slowly but, surely, slowly but surely breaking it all down to me. And what this meant for, of course, a studio to do it, but what it could mean for an artist to do it. What it could mean for a producer, an actor, a creator. It, it just meant way more than that. So it meant, it meant a lot for it to be coming from my brother, for sure. Yeah. So then as a creator, what was the first thing that appealed to you about it as you, began, like, as you became 
more and more aware of this technology. We've touched on this idea of ownership. Yeah. And we touched on this idea of like the novelty of having a collectible, someone actually gifting you an NFT. Yeah. And I firmly stand by the idea that no one forgets the first NFT they either mint or own. Yeah. So then from there, where did you start looking? What what more did you want to uncover? It made me start looking at things that I had I had already done and accomplished. Like I, I'm a toy collector. I collect a lot of like vintage toys and I collect a lot of random stuff actually. Like I, I got random <laughs> like uh like um cereal boxes, like vintage cereal boxes. I'm a very and sneakers, obviously, so it's it's a whole thing. So um cereal boxes are one of the more niche answers I've heard to that. They question. are, they are, but like what what was like my pinnacle now, like Lucky Charms did a collaboration with uh with Disney uh -huh. and they have Loki charms. And it's Loki on the front of it, but instead of, of course, the old school uh, scene. What, what is he called? Oh, Lucky. His name's Lucky, yeah. So instead of Lucky, it's Loki. But um, it, it, it's the collecting of, the, of, of NFTs is what, what drove me. And then the ownership aspect of being a creator. I think that you got to look at music. For me, knowing that there were years, and even till this day, it's, we're, we're in year 2022, and you still hear artists speaking about wanting to own their masters. That was a system that was not in place mm -hmm. for generations of artists, for generations of musicians. And we are now in a space where somebody could, not only as a musician, but someone who, as an artist, a content creator, can own what they've put out there in the world on, the, on social media platforms. I think that's an incredible place to be in mm -hmm. because you're, you're now getting the opportunity to give back to your your legacy in a sense, you know what I mean? Like my kids and my children's children will be able to have ownership of something I created that can give directly back to them. And I think that's really important to have because it was never in our entertainment industry like that before, no, no. So as you learned more and more about it, and as you said, you looked into not what you could do with it, but what you'd already done. But as a successful actor, artist, creator, you've already you know, worked into a system that probably compensated you quite handsomely for it. So what was the thing that made you think, no, the system still has to change. There's still a problem with this that we actually need to figure our way around. It was, okay, so like as an actor, you right. were hired to come on set, you're here for three months, you do your job, that's it. Mm -hmm. Now mind you, you may have a great agent who's gonna tell you like, hey, we're not gonna take all this money up front, we're gonna go try to get the back end deal. Meaning I know or we know that this month, this film is gonna make over 300 million, 200 million, so we want points on the back system. Shout out to Johnny Depp. I know what you did with Pirates of the Caribbean. I saw. <laughs> I learned from you, brother, so I know what happened with that. Um, it's, it's moments like that 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 system was built in to take care of those specific situations. But with artists, with blockchain technology, with NFTs, there's so much more that we can crack open. There's so much more that's out there for us to be able to um, not only not only hone our craft, but again, like I said, own our craft. You know, that's a, that's the ultimate part to me that just makes the most sense. Um, I'll tell you a story. I was I was 2020. I did uh, Powerline. I brought Powerline to life from a Goofy movie. Uh, I told my my Twitch channel, Hey, I go hard on Halloween every single year. I want to do this thing. I created a, a GoFundMe live on my Twitch channel, and it was funded in three days. It was great. But then the next year was coming up and they're like, are you gonna do something for Halloween this year? And I said, all right, well maybe I'll do Batman Beyond. Like no one's done it yet. I haven't seen anyone do it like a live action version. We'll do the suit. And as soon as we're getting ready to go in production, a friend of mine uh, had his fan made film stripped from YouTube. And I was like, oh. And it was stripped by the people who actually own the intellectual property of that character that they had done. So it kind of made me freeze for a second because I was like, yo, I can go put all that work in and it could get, it it could get taken. It could get taken down. So it's conversations like that and it's, it's situations like that that we have to be aware of in this new world, in this new space as far as being creators, owning our content, owning our art, using blockchain technology, talking with Tezos to hopefully lead the, lead the way for things like that, to be able to have those conversations between ourselves as creators and you know, whoever owns all these crazy IPs. So that's actually something that we should touch upon because a lot of the conversation around NFTs has been around this idea of ownership and basically new systems of monetization that help creators continue to make an income in ways that they couldn't before. But 
as you said, you could be investing a lot of time, effort, and money into building a project that focuses on something that's technically owned or like a franchise that's technically owned by someone else. So then how do you navigate that system of ownership? Or is that just like a big outstanding question? Because I mean, you've got, <laughs> you've got power line on your chest. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, if you were to develop this music video and then you NFT it, who's to say that Disney wouldn't come in and say, no, that's mine. Well, we know Disney gonna come for everything. <laughs> Let's keep it real. Uh, you know, uh, th th you're right. Who's to say that that wouldn't happen? Uh, but I think that's a, those are conversations that we all need to be having. And then I think us as creators need to just be smarter about the moves that we do make. If you know that that could be a potential issue in the future, it may not be something you want to go and fight in a couple of, of years when you're like, yeah, I did it, and then boom, it gets stripped. Um, I'm also very curious, though, just because if we put ourselves in a position where we're now owning all of the things that we've created, right? You know what, what scares me the most about it is distribution, mm -hmm. right? It takes, it takes a system to put things together and then for those things to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And to, you know, whether it's, whether it's the promotion of it, whether it's the marketing of it, whether it's the production of it, I think those are all things that we have not figured out in this space yet. If everyone owns their own thing, right? Mm -hmm. How do we all collectively collaborate, come, yeah, yeah, collaborate to then have something more, make something bigger? Who's going to sacrifice? Yeah. We've seen a system been built in for years that that's what has had to happen for things to be at the, mo the huge level, the pretty big production level. So from an industry perspective then, and from what you can gather on your side of the equation, mm. is this a conversation that's happening? Are these production companies looking to work more collaboratively with their creators to empower them in this way? Or is there a bit of an old guard situation where they're saying, ah, oh, no, forget about the NFTs, man. I think it's a mix of both. I've seen both. I've seen, I for sure have seen studios. I've sh I for sure have seen networks, uh, you know, reach out to creators to lead the way in that, in that realm because they really don't know. And like you said, it is the old guard. Mm -hmm. This is a system that has been in play for generations. And let's be honest, anything that even slightly shifts, they're gonna be like, ah, we're gonna go ahead and take that back over here. Um, I've, I've seen a little bit of both. I've seen certain networks and certain studios collaborate, and then I've also seen some that have no interest at all. Mm -hmm. They're like, nah, this isn't what's the future. We'll wait till it's a little bit more flushed out before we take a chance. So has this impacted how you negotiate yourself as an artist when engaging with media companies? Yeah, <laughs> a, little, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, yes, because it's something that I know is, if I know that that's been done already on that side, and that may be on their mind in the future, I would like to at least have the conversation when, um, you know, when, when negotiating to have my set or my stake in what may be put out on a blockchain mm -hmm. become an NFT. I would like to have my stake in that. Is there anything about it that actually makes you nervous? Because obviously this is a very new technology and we are still working out the kinks in what sort of agreements and what sort of understandings around ownership. Because at the end of the day, ownership is essentially just a social contract or a collective agreement that one person has possession or control over a certain thing. So given there's still a lot of question marks in the air, does it make you hesitant at all? Or are you kind of all in and willing to test and learn and figure it out that way? I'd rather test and learn because it's such a new world. It's so new. And, you know, we, I think so many people have seen where something takes off and then you're late to it. And then by that time, it's just like, ah, well, yeah, well, I missed that train. You know, I, I've learned my lesson in several spaces. You know, I was late to Vine. I was <laughs> late to that era, you know, because you got to think when you're coming from the acting world, like I, t I tell the story all the time, I felt like anybody who Hollywood per se did not want their actors touching social media because they knew that then the power of social media would lead the promotion directly to the actor mm -hmm. and not the studio and not mm -hmm. the project. When it's been for years, they have created who the stars are, what right. the films are. It was always a wall there. And it wasn't until they realized that there were more eyeballs going to phones, mm -hmm. laptops, websites, then coming to their theaters or some of their actors like coming to watch their films that they were like, yeah, y'all got to get on social media. Y'all got to get on social media <laughs> right now. Start dropping content. Do the next dance challenge. Like it's just <laughs> they had to adapt. So you would hope in the future that they adapt. I think that's an interesting thing. It's an interesting idea that you're raising because essentially it's 
there was a lack of willingness to relinquish control or offer artists that much creative freedom as much as it related to how they entertained their own audiences. So obviously with the onset of social media, you became a lot closer to your audience. You could communicate with them directly or you could at least put things out from your own platform. But then with this, what we call you know, the Web3 world, it's a two-way conversation, right? Like you would be, it wouldn't just be about what you offer your audience, it's what you're off, like what's your community going to say to you as well? And is that something like, obviously you've mentioned earlier, you have a Twitch community. What sort of conversations are taking place there? Lots of conversations, because <laughs> it's live streaming. But I've always, I've always been more in tuned, I think, with giving right back to the people who support you. I remember before, before Twitch, there was Justin TV, and then there was Ustream. Mm -hmm. As soon as Ustream dropped, I knew that that was going to change everything, because now I'm talking directly to the people who were interested in talking to me. And I knew that social media was going to change the dynamic as well. So um, with Twitch and being able to, you know, talk directly to everybody that's in that chat at that time, there's a lot of conversations that are like live, like life altering. Like I remember, you know, as far as Tezos, like Tezos has been a part of my Twitch stream now for the last, I want to say three to four months, mm -hmm. you know, being able to actually uh, showcase what this blockchain is, what it can do to any artist that's out there, like giving them the game to know, like so many, you know, musicians are very used to the old standard as far as like record your song, throw it on YouTube, throw it on SoundCloud, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Cool. There, that is a formula. Right. That is a formula. But did you ever consider just maybe minting it <laughs> and throwing it out there as well? Right. And just to see what maybe may, may come from that. So these are conversations that I've had on my Twitch, and I know a few artists who have done that. Just simply just by you know being there on my Twitch channel and, and giving them the game. Yeah. So then let's talk about Tezos for a second. Let's do it. Not to be a blind shill, but how did you come across Tezos, and how did you begin engaging with it? So... I was uh, working with a, a studio in New York called OS, Operating System, mm -hmm. and it, it just, call it kismet, call it, you know, just this energy. Serendipity. Serendipity, if you will. My brother and me had talked one week. The next week, I get reached out, uh, I get reached out to from Tezos asking, hey, uh, we would love to have a conversation with you and, and give you some information and, and, and bring you up to knowledge about what could be the potential future for you to start working with us as far as, far as the things you've created. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider minting this video that you did back in the day? Did you ever consider minting this picture that you did back in the day? And I was like, no, but I will <laughs> now. And it's, it's, it, that's how I got involved with them, man. And I've loved everything. I love the, the eco-friendly side of them for sure. Like that's what's been, that was the major push for me. My little sister, who is a digital artist, mm -hmm. when she did her research and came back to me and was like, you're, like she was shocked, she's like, you're working with Tesla. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it was really cool to be able to put that smile on her face. So yeah, that's what pushed me over to Tezos. So what's your sister working on? Is she minting on Tezos? She is working on, she literally uh, just promoted her, um, she, she has four original characters that she made. All right, well, let's plug them. Braids, Bun, Cap, and Puff. Thank you for the fourth one. <laughs> and Puff. She did four original characters, uh, four young black women, all different, different looks, different styles, and she has them drawn as if they were in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And just today, she promoted it on her TikTok, and what she did was she took the original sketches and then put them in magazine covers of that era. So all different colors. Like she wasn't even alive. Like she wasn't. She wasn't looking at magazines. Like she, her era doesn't. Her generation don't even know what a magazine is. Y'all right. not hanging stuff on walls. It's your wallpaper on your phone. Y'all don't do that. But the <laughs> fact that she took that. Uh, she took the inspiration from. I, I, I guess you know growing up with us and knowing that was our generation. So she is. Uh, she's gonna put those out there to the world as far as actual prints. But the digital assets will be going up to be minted on Tezos, yeah. So she's thought ahead in terms of offering both a digital product as well as a physical product and making sure people really understand what the value of that NFT actually is. There it is, there it is. So then what are you minting now? What, about, what do I want to mint? Yeah. I would like to go back and mint my very first music video, which was, uh, it's a song called Hyphy Love. Are you familiar with like the Hyphy era of music from the Bay Area, from Oakland? No, Okay. So there's Tell us everything. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> there it is. Uh, well, clearly, I'm in the dark. Yeah, <laughs> man. Educate me. That was a hell of an era, man, for sure. Um, it, 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 there was a time where finally Oakland and a lot of artists that came out of that era uh, finally had their spotlight. 
artists like E40, artists like Geek the Sneak, artists like Too Short, and the hyphy movement took over what I would say America, because all of the top one of the top 100 records or top 10 records at that time was E40 song, which was Tell Me When to Go. Um, so I did a song called Hyphy Love, which is uh, man cringeworthy when I look at it in my own way, because it's like, Ugh, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there's something there. I think it, for me, it's about the growth and the the journey of what you mm -hmm. do as a as a creator mm -hmm. in this world. Like I know that compared to what I've done recently is two completely different realms. Mm -hmm. A lot more polished now. I understand production 100. <laughs> percent I got this now. But then that's something that I would like to mention and give that to somebody, or, or excuse me, not give it, but to have it up there available for someone to be able to see what the early right. first step was before what you see now? Because everyone thinks it's just, well, when they see you, that's what you've done. Nah, everything's a journey. Yeah, I think that's another great point to touch upon. I think when people look at NFTs, a lot of people are asking the question of, where is the value really? And when it comes to brand drops and all that sort of thing, you can kind of fathom it. But then when it comes to someone minting their own work, say someone minting a poster, someone minting their own music video, the value is actually determined by the creator themselves. Because there's a point of pride. There's something that you saw that you want to essentially document as an artifact online. So in that, would you actually give it away or would you keep it for yourself? I would give it away. I've, I, I experienced it. I did it. So the sentimental value of what, like, the story that I would tell in my head and then, you know, present to the world is, like, I would want to present this to you as something that you get a chance to see the journey of a person. You got a chance to see me. Of course, the first time you ever recognized my face, it was in films. Great. But then I, trans I translated over. I went into music. Even though my first film, I did both. You know, I, I, Holes comes out, great breakout role. But then the fact that I wrote the theme song for, for the film at 13, mm -hmm. that's a journey of things that have happened. So being able to give that to somebody, the sentimental value of it, I think is, is great, man, to be able to tell that story to someone. Okay, so looking forward, what other kind? Are you planning any NFT projects currently? Yeah, I am. Tell us about that? I am. I can give an exclusive at the moment. Uh, in 2012, I started my clothing brand, Slick Living. Uh huh. And then I started its sister company in 2014, Glam, which stands for Goddess Living Amongst Men. Mm -hmm. I wanted to change uh, the when I think of glam, I, I, glamour, you know, glamorous, sure. and of course, yeah. of course, of sure. But when I have my little sister, is kind of the person who changed my view as far as the things that go on. Um, in this world as a woman. Mm -hmm. And it was because of her and the, the, the pedestal that I put my mom on that I wanted to be able to change or do what I can with my platform to help sure. in any way possible. So I started Glam and uh, we're working on some cool slick living releases for the uh, werewolves and we're working on some cool releases for Glam which is Goddess Living Amongst Men. Do we have a timeline? We are in March right now, yes? Yes. June. June. Okay, June. so very soon. So everyone June. needs to keep their eyes peeled. Yes. That's very, very exciting. Really excited for it, yeah. Okay, and so let's talk about your Twitch community for a second. Cool. We've mentioned them a couple times in this conversation, but I think Twitch is an interesting one where we've spoken to other artists. Like I've interviewed Mike Shinoda a couple times, as I mentioned to you before. Yeah. And he was also one whose eyes were turned to Tezos because of someone within his Twitch community. Mm -hmm. um, and his conversation, his venture into NFTs kind of kicked off because he was interacting with essentially a very young audience who were very much big fans of his work. So what are some of the other lessons that your community have taught you? Ooh, some of the other lessons for me with Twitch, it was, uh, okay, so like content creation and anyone that's going to Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, you know, that's a recording. You're recording it, you're putting it together. It's your own little mini movies, whether it's, if it's a photo or it's a video or reel. Um, but with, with Twitch, it's live. It's right there. And right before the pandemic, did I already tell this story as far as Fox Soul? Did I say that up here? I didn't, right? Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for the audience. Thanks, Kadeem. <laughs> <laughs> so f right before the pandemic kicked off, I was sitting down with a network called Fox Soul. I felt like we didn't have a Arsenio Hall of our generation. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have my own late night talk show. I pitched them the idea. They were in on it. Second week of the second week of April, we're supposed to shoot the pilot. Boom, pandemic hits. Mm -hmm. Gone. Damn. Now they're like, all right, well, we can switch it to virtual, but I didn't want to go virtual because I felt like the live studio audience is what I remembered watching. And I just think it gives a different feeling. Right. So I took all of my ideas that I did have for the the show and I took it to Twitch. Mm -hmm. and, and within two and a half months, and I studied it though. I studied it because it was something that I had seen others try, but not understand how it worked. So what were your hesitations with that? Um, 
the hesitations for me was the migration. Okay. I felt like trying to migrate anybody off of a platform that everyone is already hooked to is a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I sat for a month and a half and took myself to school. I had a notebook <laughs> and everything. <laughs> I took myself to school and I watched every YouTube video. I watched other people's Twitch streams to understand how this ecosystem worked. And it's completely different from everything else. Right. Because you are now entertaining an audience for a long period of time. With everything else, it's a drop and go. Hey, enjoy it. Comment, like on it if you want. Repost it on this so shirt. suddenly you're being forced to reply immediately. Uh, you're in there. Right. You're in there. And it's an experience. It's a show. So it's it's for me being like, um, I, I mean, you were talking earlier. I was like, I'm a big WWE fan. And I'm like, I think that the fact that this company has sold billions of dollars in merchandise off of fake fighting is more than enough reason to open your ears and listen to right. what they and watch and study. So I, um, you know, I started my Twitch channel, and it's been an amazing journey to to build with with Twitch. Now they they noticed that I, I actually understood what this was. You know, I, I didn't come on just simply just doing gaming. Mm -hmm. I had a, I had a talk show idea at first. So let's get the graphics up. Let's have the transitions come in, and next thing is this: hit the button on the stream deck. It's all right there, and that's not something that I believe, especially for you know people in my culture. That wasn't something that we were hip to, you yeah. know. All we knew is likes and comments. That's it. But right. there was no monetization there. For mm -hmm. years, you were posting on social media hoping for a brand deal. Mm -hmm. I get it because it happened to that person and maybe that guy back there. But, right. like, there's millions of people doing the same thing. So how do you set yourself apart? You go make the content live, monetize, monetize via Twitch, and then take all that content that you did and repurpose it across all socials. Right. So you clearly did a lot of your homework before actually engaging in a new platform in Twitch. Yeah. Twitch is much more of, like, I guess, a niche space and one where there is a lot of kind of these blockchain discussions happening because it is, it is a younger crowd. It is yes. one that are a lot more open to this kind of technology and the potential that it serves and those that are actually more willing to see, especially in the gaming realm, how something can hold value in a digital space. Because let's be honest, people are spending money on skins, they're spending money on weaponry, and that was before there were even legitimate marketplaces. You were trading that in school. True. So then... Let's level it like let's dig into that a little deeper. Like you did your homework, but at the same and these are people who are fairly well versed in this subject material and understand the principles behind it. But not everyone's on this channel that are watching you. So sometimes when you launch a project, and we've seen this throughout this industry overall, you'll get an NFT drop, or you'll get a blockchain focused project or a web three metaverse related anything. And the people just shut off and they don't like it at all because they just think that you're like you're following or you're hopping on the bandwagon. So what are some of the messages that you wish you could communicate very clearly to those people who still have that big question mark on their face when you engage in this kind of thing and believe that maybe you're just hopping onto a bandwagon or following a fad? For me, it's, it's speaking from two places. One, as the creator, the ownership of it, right? Mm -hmm. But then as an actual collector, like knowing that I'm getting the chance to have an exclusive from this artist or from right. this creator, like that's what it is for me. Knowing that, having that in my digital wallet, knowing that one day like there can be a Cleo Thomas Digital Museum with all these different artists that I've collected, whether it is something that's you know digitally painted, whether it's a song, whether it's a video, like that's something that, that really piques my interest. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's re like really played in with the, well now it's the Meta Quest, it was the Oculus Quest, but now it's the Meta Quest, mm -hmm. who's played in that space, like I know what is the potential, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I, I think that it's, it's the right messaging and the right people right. To, to really see the future of what's actually happening. It's not like it's, this is not happening right in front of your eyes. It's going on across the board. You just happen to just have those senses numb, I'm assuming. But that's on you. That's on you. But the, the, the education is out there. So the message is dial in. It's all happening. There it is. <laughs> so let's talk about what NFTs you have. OK. Because <laughs> we've been touching upon your wallet a couple times in this conversation. Yeah. So what are the projects that have caught your eye? Uh, so of, of course, like I mentioned, the Ghostbusters joint, right? Yeah. And then um, I got to give a big shout out to Red Bull uh -huh. because Red Bull and Tezos did this cool thing for the uh, the Formula, Formula One. One. Yep, shout out to Verstappen. I see you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Verstappen was wild, and the next week after I got mine, I was like, 
Yo, you can't be talking like this, bro. You gotta <laughs> chill out. Um, that, and then even today, actually, I don't know if anyone who's here had the opportunity to go to the studio at the very first, the little first square down the way. Blue Vishnu, yeah. What is it called one more time? Blue Vishnu. Blue yep. Vishnu. You can actually get yourself scanned in to have your own digital NFT. And I'm like, do you know what happens if you put that anywhere on Earth? People, <laughs> everyone's pulling up for that. So I have that as well. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Marcus Prime, he has some NFTs, and I'm really excited to support him on his journey with that. Uh, McFly, an artist named It's McFly, who I've been a fan of for so long. And if you haven't seen his artwork, you're missing out. And if you have seen it, you'll know it exactly when you see it. So yeah, those are some of the artists that I have in my wallet currently. Yeah. So a lot of your, whether it relates to your own career, but also the careers of your fellow creators, is focused on their empowerment through this idea of ownership in a digital space. So. Let's paint a little picture of what you see this media and entertainment world looking like in, mm. say, five years, ten years down the line. Five to ten years. I hope that every question we have now about this stuff is figured out, to be quite honest. Mm. Um, you know, or, earlier we touched on the, the, the distribution of so many independent content creators or creators in general. That's the part that it still has me kind of like, where do we go with that? How do you get right. uh, so many creatives in one space and they all get a chance to come together and make something that they all can benefit off of? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet. Right. So that's my one too, because I, I come and like I, I had to try to deconstruct the whole filming aspect. Like when you're on a set, poof, there's a team here. There's a team back there running everything right now. I said, Hi, I don't even know. Where the, where's our main camera at? I didn't ask <laughs> you beforehand. There. That one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that camera. Hi, guys. Um, it's, it's things like that. There's a whole team here doing that. So it, I'm, I'm thinking from that place. And I had to try to deconstruct my whole you know, upbringing for that to think, how do you do it independently? But now that we're going back into this space, how do you get all of these people to collaborate right. and then distribute like that? So everyone who essentially has a stake in this effort should have something to yield from all of this as well. Yes, not just yeah. as an independent, though, not yeah. just as one. I would love to see yeah. seven, ten, a hundred make something happen. Yeah. And I think that's actually a point that's not very often raised because when we speak of creator and like the ownership of this creative space, we're talking about individual artists. We're talking about if I paint a picture, I'm a terrible artist, but if I were to mint it, that's mine. No one else helped me with that's that. Picasso. <laughs> that's Picasso. At that point, you don't know that. That's yeah. Picasso. Yeah. If Picasso can be big, so can I. <laughs> there it is. There it is. But essentially, yeah, I think it's, it's the idea that it takes a village to pull off some of the creative things that we see out in this world yeah. and making sure that everyone has a stake of ownership in that and everyone is rewarded for that effort in a fair and ethical way is probably one of the bigger questions we're going to see in this space. And who do you think should be accountable for answering that? Is that traditional media? Is that the original production companies or the, the dogs at the top? I don't think so. I think it needs to be the creatives. I think... We're the ones in the, in the midst of the jungle right now dealing with it. Mm -hmm. if, if there happens to be somebody, a head honcho or a, a gatekeeper who could be like, oh, that's what you guys are doing? Oh, well, here's how to make it better. If, if y'all got the answer, please come, come on in and, and join the fun. Uh, but I think it should be the creatives. I think it comes from us. I think it comes from us collaborating. And that's how so many great things happen. That's how many great special moments that we've seen throughout our generation happen with more people coming together. It's great to, you know, give praise and spotlight one person mm -hmm. for the great thing that they did. Yeah. But if you can get people together, man, and do something really special, especially in this world, especially right now, especially with how small the world is. Are you collaborating at all with other fellow like NFT creators, whether they're artists, whether they're musicians, gamers? So my my plan is to make sure that my little sister has her spotlight first. That's mm -hmm. my overall plan. You know, she's again, she just turned 18 and it's really cool to see her take on that that entire like journey as a, I saw her learn it. And that's been the great part for me to see her learn it. From her asking me, like, how do I make a T-shirt? OK. <laughs> Here's how you make a t-shirt. Okay, well, how do I print these, you know, these print? This is how you do it. And she has taken every initiative to do it by herself just from asking one question. Right. So that would be, I would like to give back to her in that way that she would be the first person that I do get a chance to collaborate to bring her NFTs to a spotlight. Yeah, I think that's what's wonderful is that if your sister is 18, did you say? Just turned 18. And has the power and the tools to create this, all of, all of this for herself without having to rely on an alternative system or some kind of market validation, to put a technical term on it, to have someone actually do the distribution. She can produce, manufacture, design. She can do the entire gig. Yeah, man. Shout out to Kalia. Uh, <laughs> X, 
KT Creations. X underscore KT Creations. That's her socials. Well, there you go, guys. Definitely yeah. check it out. Yeah. I do want to take a very quick moment to do a and a just because we've only got 10 minutes left. Right. So if you'd like to ask Cleo any questions, now is your chance. Any question at all. I'm taking all of them. You can throw it out there. Don't be shy. We can have a conversation about the NBA. We can have a conversation <laughs> about sneakers, video games. I'm about it all. Yeah. No? What sneakers do you wear? These are currently the Toro Red 5s. Okay. Yeah, but the question, I know the, the, the live stream didn't hear him. He asked me what sneakers I'm wearing. These are the Toro Red 5s. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah man, I love these. They re-released these like twice, and I was like, I'm getting them on the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Sneaker fan? Yeah, I like them. You like them. Okay, for sure. <laughs> Appreciate it. Toro 5s, brother. Yeah, Toro Air Jordan 5s. I mean, that's actually a good thing to lean into. So, we've been talking about art, gaming, like the the material that you put out, but when it comes to things like collectibles, yeah. are there collectibles that are emerging in a digital space that you have your eye on? Would you be a digital a digital sneaker collector? For there's example? a there's a booth here. There is indeed. What's the name of the booth over there? Flex. Flex. <laughs> yes. Yo, Flex. I only had uh, unfortunately I only got in here maybe like ten minutes before we had to come live, and I walked right by the booth and I was like, what is what are those? Like. <laughs> Vine, what are those? Wow. <laughs> no, but I, I would like to know more about Flex. I would like to know more about, so make sure you guys go check out the Flex uh, sneakers, digital sneakers that are here. Yeah, so that's that's another area that we haven't actually touched on this conversation is that, that bridging of the gap between online and offline and augmented reality, right? Yeah. So the idea of, you know, a pair of NFT sneakers you own might be manufactured as physical sneakers for you to wear mm. or they could be augmented reality. So when you scan your own shoes or you take a photo, suddenly your fashion looks a little bit different. Yeah. Is that a, I mean, is that something your sister could be interested Listen, in? Listen, if I could have my entire closet virtual, oh my God, I'd be the <laughs> flyest avatar ever. Oh my God. Oh my, my sneaker collection, my, listen, I could dress. Don't get it wrong. Just because you see me in a black bomber jacket and black joggers and a white sea and sneak. Listen. <laughs> Listen, bro, I pull out this YSL suit. It's a whole different game. So if I could get my entire closet into the virtual space, I would 100% do that. So you've already scanned your 3D NFT avatar. Yeah. And now we have to dress him. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we've got to dress him from head to toe. Make sure he's slick living, man. 100%. It's got to be like that. Uh, and that's crazy because that is something that I know so many people would be into. Because you brought up earlier, like, you got to think of all, like, the uh, in-game purchases. Right. Microtransactions that right. we've seen on apps. Those are, That's what's been happening anyway. You've mm -hmm. been customizing your character from head to toe for mm -hmm. generations. Yeah. So it's that space. I think it's breaking that 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 uh, that bridge open for people to understand that it's the exact same thing. You're going to want to look fresh in the digital world, too. <laughs> Trust me. You're going to want to look fresh and fly. <laughs> How much time do you would you say that you interact in this digital world where you would place that much value or care into this avatar space specifically? I, I don't think it's going to be our generation. Like, I'm 33. Okay. I don't think it's going to be our generation who are fully immersed. Mm -hmm. It's going to be not even the... What's after Gen Z's? Gen Alpha. We're back at one. <laughs> so, 